film. This is one of those Buñuel films that seem to be realism all the way through. It's it's one of his less surreal films. And then at the end, this all of a sudden there is an explosion. A special effect. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it is true, but it was. It never came up to to us that we could make this film in another way than realistically. You know, uh, the only great difference is that the book uh, by Octave Mirbeau was written by the end of the 19th century and published at that time. So the, the book, the story of the book takes place when Bunuel was a baby, was born. So the main decision and the first decision he made was to make the film closer to us. And uh, in order to protect an image that he had of his childhood, like a paradise, you know, he didn't want to touch to the period of the 1990, let's say 1900, because he was young at that time, was living in Spain, and uh, to him for his whole, whole life, when he was speaking about that period, it was really a sort of golden age, you know. So, uh, he was telling me once, it was a time, when um, a, a newspaper in in, the, in the Saragossa, which is the main city in the state of Aragon where he was born, the big title was a, a, a man uh, on a bicycle got hurt on the main road, you know. <laughs> and he used to say to me, to have such a big title in one paper, what a time of peace and happiness it must have been, you know. <laughs> True <laughs> heaven. Yeah, yeah. Can you um, imagine today? So, tell us a bit about how you made this film, because this is your first film with Bunuel. Before that, you'd written a novel. Mm -hmm. Then you worked with Jacques Tati, who wanted you to write a book of... No, I, I was just a beginner. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, a friend of mine, Micheline Rosan, who was to become the director of the Théâtre des Bouffes du Nord, where I worked with Peter Book for 40 years, uh, was uh, the agent of Jeanne Moreau. I don't know how she heard about me. She read one of my books, and she called me once for a, for a, a dinner in a place, and I was a really a beginner. I was coming back from the military service, the war in Algeria, and I, I was just a good student. I was coming out of a high school, and I could be a teacher. And at that dinner, you, you wouldn't believe, I arrived, Jeanne Moreau was there because she was the agent of Jeanne Moreau and she was supposed to be in the, in the next uh, Bill Mel film. We didn't know which one yet. Orson Welles, Peter Brook, and Maurice Beja were there, you know, around the table. Great dinner. You so I, I said, what am I doing here? <laughs> well, <laughs> and with Peter Brook, we, we were to work for 40 years together. We're still working together. He's 91 soon, next spring. Tell you a secret, he was born the day of the spring, 21 of March, which is a good sign. Right. <laughs> so, uh, Bunuel was there, not at the dinner, and uh, she knew the producer, and the producer told her, we are looking for a young French screenwriter able to write in correct French and knowing the French country. I am from most of the, like most of the French from the countryside, and uh, I write more or less French. Um, so uh, Micheline, the name of that woman, told the producer, Serge Silberman, there is one young guy who is apparently is gifted, and, uh, and uh, they sent me to the Cannes Film Festival, where Benuel was there, you know, and they, not me alone, they sent several young writers like me, you know, each one one day. And I had a lunch with Benuel. I, was, uh, I went to his hotel. I didn't go at all at the festival. Took the plane in the morning and back in the afternoon. And uh, Benuel was sitting, I remember, at the terrace of the hotel, speaking with some friends. At one o'clock, you know, uh, punctually, you know, he got up, said goodbye, and went to me. Are you Mr. Carrier? Yes. How are you? First, and uh, and uh, let's go to the to the dining room and let's have a lunch. And um, we, we, I was extremely, you know, intimidated. You can imagine uh, being uh, for the first time alone with Benoit. 
And the first question was, uh, looking at me like this, uh, do you drink wine? So I said, uh, not only, I, which is the truth, not only I drink wine, but I am the, from a winemaker family. Oh, he said, <laughs> so that was really a good point. You know, that. he said later, if you uh, if you had been, you know, an uh, useless writer, at least we could have talked about wines. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and then we start um, having a lunch, just the two of us, and uh, he asked me, of course, who I was and what I had done. I had done very little, you know, three years in the military service and, and high school, which didn't interest him at all. But in what I had done, there were two things. I had made two uh, short films with Pierre Etex in the tradition of the slapstick, the American slapstick, you know. And one of them had won the Academy Award, the Oscar, you know. I was so innocent when I arrived to the office, the producer was jumping out of joy and saying, we got the Oscar, we got the Oscar. And I said, what's the Oscar? I didn't know yet. <laughs> so uh, the fact that uh, nobody realized that the 10 great years of the, the American slapstick, the 20s, are strictly corresponding to the best 10 years of the surrealism. It's not, it's not by chance, it's not a hazard, you know, that on one side of the uh, Atlantic Ocean, the surrealism, and on the other side, the slapstick. And there are many, many relations between the two and movements. The, the surrealists loved and slapstick, they, they loved they slapstick. Loved silent comedy. In the first number, the first issue of the, the review, the famous review, La Révolution Surrealiste, there is a, a photography of Buster Keaton. And Bunuel himself, had, I didn't know at that time, had written some articles about Keaton. When one of the, the articles was beginning by the films of Buster Keaton are beautiful like bathrooms. Like? Uh, it's a salle de bain. Know, like bathrooms. bathrooms. Right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I can see that. No, I, I can see we that. can imagine. Yeah. You know. So that was a first common point, you know, and, and the second was that I had written the commentary of a, document, of a documentary about the sexual life of animals. And what I didn't know, uh, the first, um, when he was a student, Buñuel was studying, you know, uh, 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 the animals, especially the insects, you know. And it was until the end of his life, he was able to see in Latin, to say in Latin, the name of any insect we would meet. So there was another point of, uh, you know, going together. We right. were at, at least we had some, some, or at least two things to talk about. Yeah. You know. Um, now you adapted several novels with him. Uh, Belle de Jour was a novel. Uh, that this obscure one, object mm. of desire also mm. started as a novel. But when Bunuel worked with novels, was there ever the idea to be faithful to the novel? Or was the, all, the novel always an object which you had to transform or use as an excuse for something else? Anyway, it is absolutely clear that we have to transform. We are not going to screen the... the, the the book, you know, for two hours looking at the book. No, no. this would be an interesting experience, but <laughs> with a voiceover. <laughs> and uh, of course we knew that, but uh, I didn't know at all what, what I knew the book. I had, uh, I had uh, read the book, of course. I knew it was a question of Octave Mirbeau. But the question was not a question of being faithful to the book or to the theater play. The question always, not only for Bunuel, the question is to make a film. It means to change completely from one language to another one, from the language of literature to the language of cinema, which is even more complex than the language of theater and literature. And you have to know this language if you want to write scripts and, and, and uh, to become a, a screenwriter or a director. So. Uh, being faithful to a novel has really no meaning. Faithful to what? To the action, to the, to the writing, to the style? No. If we adapt an, a novel or a play like Cyrano de Bergerac, uh, it is, it's because we find in that novel possibilities of scenes between characters, different, and scenes being 
acted by actors. You know, that's the, to go. It's possible to go from one language to the other one. You know, it is possible, keeping more or less the same structure of the story. So the question of the first four, we have to make a film. That's all. You know, that's uh, that's the main point, and it was the same for uh, for the, the the last film and and for uh, a belle de jour. And something you say in your book, the secret language of cinema, you say the film only starts to exist the moment the script disappears. Yes, uh, the script is a, is a very strange object because it is uh, a very brief existence. And the, at the end of the shooting, we find the scripts in the, in the garbage. You know, they're, they're, they're dead. They have become films, good or bad, that depends, you know. But uh, the fact uh, that uh, a script is a written object doesn't count at all. I mean, it's uh, just convenient to make the film to remember what they have to do, what they have to say, you know. Uh, it's very rare to publish a script. It happened to me only twice, you know. No, no. Because you can, it's difficult to read. You have to know the, the the cinema techniques more or less to read a script. And when the film is over, the script uh, has no utility anymore. So you throw it away. Yeah. Now there are some collectors, <laughs> some collectors of uh, films already uh, of scripts already made into films, and uh, with some notes, you know, by, with the hand, by the hand of Fritz Lang, or to, and some of them are very valuable. You know. I have some by Binuel, with Binuel notes. So. But then the, 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 the question is going really to make, is it possible to make a film out of this book? The book by Birmo tells the story of a, of a maid, of a chambermaid, who goes from one place to another one. She has about 10 different, you know, uh, uh, directors, I mean, patron. So it was very difficult. It looked, uh, it, it could have looked like a, a film, a sketch, you know, different sketches. So our first decision during that lunch, and we had both and the same idea, which was obvious, was to put several characters in the same family, to make them the same family, like the, the, to make the, the man with the boots, you know, the maniatic, uh, the, the father of the, of the lady of the house, you know. To, just to put the, the things, not to be, uh, to take a train every time to go from one place to the other one, and to keep the same characters from beginning to end. Yeah. So that was the main decision, the first one. You know. But it, it, it's absolutely natural. Um, what's very strange watching this film is it feels like a very cynical film in a way because all the possibilities are so terrible. Um, there's a murder mystery which is never really solved, but we think we know the answer anyway. Mm -hmm. And Celestine has the choice between these terrible men. Um, it's really interesting, the, the, the version with that Benoit Jaco made of this film mm -hmm. earlier this year. Um, there is actually one love story which which works, and it's it's a, a a very you know a moment of romance. Here she has no hope. You know she ends up with one terrible man, but but all the other men who are interested in her are, are horrifying as well. And it's a very it, it feels almost like a kind of nihilistic but, but we, film. We never thought about uh, making a black film. You know, uh, like as, as as you say, as a matter of fact, it's not very optimistic. But it's a portrait of a certain level of bourgeoisie, of French bourgeoisie, at a certain time. The relations between the, the masters and the, the servants are not the same today at all. You know, they change. They were not the same in the 19th century. That's a rest of the past, you know. And the more we, we went, it was against... Uh, our own will. We didn't decide to make the film black and anti-bourgeois or whatever at all. We wanted to write interesting scenes. And the, but the more we, we went, the more we looked at the film and the script, we thought that the film was like a, how do you say in English, marécage, like a, a swamp, you know, like a swamp with emerging some faces here and there you know that's that the idea i have of the film now is uh, is the idea of a swamp here yeah, really and uh, but not trying to be uh, more black than the black you know the, or the reality 
at all. It was trying to be interesting all the time. What's going to happen? How are the relations between the people and the, how do they? Is there a possible evolution? You know, and also how the characters that play Michel Piccoli is the 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 image of desolation, of unhappiness. There is absolutely nothing in his life. He can't even make love to the to the other mate. You know, uh, uh, he tried everything possible to get out, and it's, he lives in a totally closed, uh, uh, closed, on itself world. You know, that that was yes decided from the very beginning, but that was already in the, in the book. Yeah. So it. all the films that you and Bunuel made together, did you ever over time find echoes? of the films you've made before. Yeah. Did you feel, for example, when you were making um, that obscure object of desire, did you ever think, oh, the Fernando Rey character, he's, he's quite similar to the fetishist in this film, or he's quite similar to um, no, the Michel Piccoli character? I don't think we, uh, no, we never, we never, I think we never talk about it. Maybe secretly we thought about it, but uh, who can remember all the thoughts he had in his life? Nobody, if not, I would invent, you know, I would, uh, and I, of course. No, it was, I remember, i give you one example. Uh, we had to write a boring scene the, the, in the dining room. The scenes in the dining room, by definition, are always boring. You know, people are sitting, you know, and they have to talk and say something to make the, the story go, go, go ahead. So uh, we were looking for what could happen interesting in that, uh, in that scene. And um, all of a sudden, Benoit said, the lady uh, uh, could uh, take a little piece of bread, and she would, she go, the camera follows her hand, and there is a white boar there on the, on, the, on, the, on the ground, and he is eating the bread. In other words, they have a wild boar in the house. A boar? Boar, yes, wild boar. If you know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I said, uh, yes, I, I liked it. At the first time he told me that, I said, yes, I liked it. It's very funny, the idea that this little bourgeoisie family is uh, <laughs> living with a wild boar. You know? And then after maybe two minutes, he told me, but you are so stupid. <laughs> you know, yeah. Why? I said, you don't understand. Put yourself in the seats of the spectator. If you do that, you know, everybody is going to, to wonder, what's, when are we going to see the white boar again? <laughs> and the characters lose any interest. You know, they are only interested in the white boar. <laughs> and then the film becomes the white boar story. You know, so, so forget about it. And so, and he forgot about his own idea. You know, just to give you an example, I remember it's a way of working. He can go the other, the other, the other way. Uh, sometimes, you know, sometimes can. At the beginning, I didn't dare of criticizing the idea. So, Benoit, you know, Benoit says something to you. We are not going to go. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you know. So, so he sent me, Serge Silberman, the producer from Paris, we had a dinner together without Pinuel, which was very rare. And the producer, the producer told me he's very happy working with you. He said to me, Jean-Claude is a very good, uh, very hard worker, you know, can, uh, but Serge told me, you must tell him no from time to time. I was a Mr. Yes. Mm. Without realizing I was working with Pinuel. You know, so when did you first idols, say no? You know, so I, and it's difficult to, 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 to be in contradiction, yeah. you know, not to like what he proposes. Yeah. But the moment I dare, you know, I, it came slowly. Then we were working almost on the same level, at right. least in the script, you know. He doesn't need a secretary to, to register, you know, his own ideas. He needs someone to answer, not to disagree, and to propose. To propose Bunuelian ideas. And you, know. you had various rituals when you were working together that you used to every day, you would tell each other your dreams. You know, we, were, we used to work in the morning three hours, in the afternoon three hours, and that night I would take two hours to write to, as a scene what we have been talking about during the day. And every morning, the first thing was to tell one to the other his dreams. And uh, it, it was the beginning of the work, you know. 
you must start with dreams. Of course, sometimes you dream and sometimes you don't. You know, so, and I, he had, I knew a phrase by André Breton, you know, the Pope of Surrealism, a saying about somebody, this man is a bastard, he never dreams. So, you'd better have dreams, you know, <laughs> <I> remember. <laughs> so, from time to time, I was inventing some dreams, you know, some dreams, trying to, to, to be as far as possible from yeah. the story. And, uh, but apparently, he did accept this invention, because this invention comes also from something unconscious, yeah. probably, you know, so. That was the first. Uh, the second was to look at the, at the work of the day before, you know, to read again what I had typed on the typing machine and uh, to discuss what we had done yesterday and then to go to, to keep going. But we had two rules. Not at the very beginning, but uh, it comes. It came slowly. One was at the end of the afternoon, around uh, five thirty, we would stop working for half an hour. We would stay uh, each of us in our room. In this half an hour, we had the obligation every day to invent each of us a story, long, short, whatever, in relation with the script or not. And then we would meet in the, in the in the bar, of course, to have a drink before the dinner, and we would tell each other the story we have been invented. That was a ritual. I don't know thousands of stories, you know, that cross the air between Bill and me, all along twenty years. You know, it's uh, it was very. And sometimes one of these short stories was in a gag, a word, you know, a short moment, you know would take place in the, in the, in the, in the film. And uh, that was like an athlete training his body, yeah. was training the imagination. It's a discipline. You know, the imagination is, uh, our brains, is very brilliant sometimes, but he has a tendency, whatever the brain, to be lazy, to do as little as possible. So, so you have to, from time to time, to yeah. persecute and muscle. insist to mess into it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, we've got time for some questions, and there's a microphone going around. So, if anyone would like to start the bidding, and uh, yes, someone over here, um, just coming down the aisle to you. Hang on a sec. Yep, go ahead. Hello, good evening. I, uh, it's lovely to hear you speak. Thank you. I wanted to ask you about how um, how much the script that you wrote was the script that was shot in terms of the dialogue and. Also, a little bit about how it worked with the actors, because the scenes there were very, I mean, the scenes were all a acted. They were all acted so wonderfully and timed almost, you know, very precisely. And so I was wondering about that. So, uh, first of all, uh, Benuel, uh, and together we, we were working on the film writing four, five, sometimes six different versions of the same script until we were totally satisfied. Doesn't mean that the script was good, but we couldn't go any further. So that means that the, for the shooting, we will never change, you know, never improvise, you know. He had no time. He was shooting very rapidly and very faithful to the, to the, to the script, you know. So the, the script has to be as uh, precise as complete as as possible, you, you know. Uh, that was the only, uh, the, and he never, uh, he asked me not to put any technical words in the script. Never see the word camera, you know. You describe the action, but the director himself does the rest. Does the rest of the technical work. Never to 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 precise a traveling, you know, a camera movement, uh, whatever, no, a, a close up. Nothing ever, you know. That was his work. It's part of or a personal uh, part of the work. But once that was done, for the rest, he was very faithful to the script. It happened very rarely that we cut something or uh, we add something improvised. I think never in uh, all along twenty years, you know. But there was uh, something else in your question that I did not answer, but I forgot what it was. Ah, that was very precise, technically precise. I, I, I'm, I'm explaining what I mean. 
During the shooting of this film, after two weeks, Jeanne Moreau came up to me and she said, I have the feeling that Bunuel doesn't like what I do at all. Because he never speaks to me about how to act. He says, you go from this place to this place, you look there, you say your line, you turn and you go out. And that's what he said. I have the feeling that he doesn't like at all what, uh, what I'm doing. So I went to, very often the screenwriter is the go-between the actors and the directors, you know. Because sometimes they don't talk to each other at all, you know. So there is, they need somebody to go. And the, so I went to see Bilouin and Jean Moreau worries about her. Well, why? He said, because she just, so I repeat what I just said. And Bilouin told me, but what could I tell her? She's teaching me details about her character. That's beautiful, you know. That when the actor is so possessed by what he does, that he, he gives to the director things that the director was not expecting. That's one wonderful. And uh, sometimes he had some hard time with some actors. I won't tell you the names. <laughs> but most of the time, they, it went very well. He, he knew very well the, the cinema techniques he had formed in Hollywood, he was an assistant for a long time, you know, so that he knew perfectly well, well enough to reproach to the cameraman or to the lighting director some uh, bad things they had done, you know, some mistakes. You know, so. But uh, fast forward to the script and sometimes uh, letting actors like Jean Moreau doing exactly how she felt and sometimes, like in the same film, going to hypnotize an actor like the man with the, the little boots, you know, who was incapable to act in this, Pinuel remained and was a very good hypnotizer. And uh, 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 stay with him alone on the set for half an hour, then everybody went back, you know, on socks, you know, slowly, silently, and he shot the scene with the little boots, you know. And he, 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 if not, he could, the man couldn't play this. You know. And he, so he did the same with Georges Marshall in Belle de Jour. The scene of the, of the coffin in Belle de Jour, Georges is totally hypnotized. He doesn't know what he says. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yes, over there. Um, I'm wondering what motivated you to get into screenwriting and what advice would you have for someone who is interested in getting into it today? Yes, yes, you don't um, what, what motivated you to become a screenwriter and what advice would you give to someone who wanted to do it today? Uh, one of the main decisions of my life was not to be a director, not to be a film director. I was attracted, I was born, like uh, most of you, in the first century in history, to have invented new ways of writing. You know, if we were in at, the, at the time of uh, the, the film, you know, at the end of the 19th century, we could talk only about theater and literature. You know, think about all the new ways: cinema, radio, you know, uh, uh, recording and uh, television, and all the new techniques that we have invented, and they all need a new language. And all my life, I have been extremely, you know, uh, attracted by these new languages, you know. I, that is to say, we were talking literature. I was even more interested by l'écriture than by the story. You, know, you understand why? You know. So, l'écriture, you mean in, in the the, terms the of the style of the, the actual writing? Mean, yeah. uh, in the writing itself, there yeah. is a style, there is a feeling, there is an intelligence, you know, and, and uh, nobody knows till today that for the cinema is the same. You know, the cinema had to learn step by step, and all the great directors, you know, had uh, a little stone, his own language. You know, and today, uh, you have to, to know this language the way it is today, but without ignoring that tomorrow it will be different. And there are some scenes that we understand today that we won't understand tomorrow and vice versa, that we would not... Uh, and have understood uh, 50 years ago. When I start writing a script, uh, the scripts are completely different of what they are today. You know? Everything was written very precisely, including the 
I don't know, the diaphragm of the camera, you know, uh, uh, sometimes a lot of drawings. Because these films were shot in studio. So the, the script, which was called very often the Bible, was, com you know, having the whole film inside. You give this to the set designer and he makes a film. And uh, uh, once Buñuel was uh, in Los Angeles and uh, when he was young, and he was a close friend with Ron Stenberg, you know. And Stenberg was shooting a film with Marlene Dietrich. And Buñuel went to the, to the studio one day and it was a huge crowd of Chinese people, you know, a huge set, uh, boats, uh, cars, taxis, uh, cranes, everything you, you can imagine. But uh, no actors. The actors weren't, weren't there. There were just extras, and Marlene wasn't there. So, and the, the director wasn't there, Stenberg. So, Pinuel asked the assistant, where is Joseph? Oh, must be at the cafeteria, probably at that time. So he went to the cafeteria and Joseph Stenberg was there and Binwell said to him, you know, they are, they are preparing the shooting. Yes, I know. Said, yeah, of course. But uh, you are not there? No, I don't, they don't need me. You know, they know what they have to do. In other words, the director was intervening only, of course, in the writing of the script and to direct the actors at the very last moment. And uh, Jean Renoir said the same about Marcel Pagnol you know, the, the French uh, uh, dramaturgist and uh, director. Jean Renoir went one day to m meet Pagnol during the shooting of one of the Pagnol's films. And a great scene, a lot of people in the streets of a village in the south. Pagnol wasn't there, the director. I mean. So Jean Renoir asked, uh, no, Marcel is not here. Should be at the bistro there, at the coffee, having a drink, you know. He went to the, Jean Renoir went to the coffee. He tells this in his memoirs. And uh, as a matter of fact, Marcel Pagnol was there having a pastis. And Jean, Jean Renoir said, you are not there with the, no, why? Said Marcel, I would bother them. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think more directors should stay away from the set. It would be a very good thing. Um, okay, let's have some more. Um, no, the, the other way to, uh, to answer is oh, that yeah. I was attracted by the fact of writing, yeah. and I want also to write for theatre and to keep uh, writing and publishing books. You know, the, the moment you are a movie director, you have a star here, and I like a tag, M Mr. Director, you are, you are the, the little king of your little kingdom, but you can't do anything else. Jean Renoir tried, wrote some very nice films, uh, books. He was never considered as a writer or as a novelist, never. You, know. you, are the, the, you are the chief, but you can't do otherwise than making films. Yeah. And I was attracted by all these uh, different ways of, uh, and some, some of them new, of writing. Um, yes, just to elaborate a bit on uh, about Bunuel's relationship with his photographers, because in many of his films, um, the choice of angle, the way a scene is shot, um, it's very um, distinctive and very kind of organic to the to the film itself. It's a, it's almost as if the camera is speaking sometimes. So just to for me to be um, a little bit clear about what you were saying. Are you saying that Bunuel always let the, the director of photography do what, what he wanted? Or, or was there a much closer Of course thing not. I didn't no. uh, talk about Bunuel, but about Walt Stenberg. It ah. was another way. The Hollywood way was totally different. You know, the, the set designer, as a matter of fact, was making the film. The film was made in the, in the book. You know, and then they have to, no, Binwell was, was different. He was uh, himself a very good technician, and he knew very well, and he wanted to impose his way of framing a scene, you know, uh, cutting, etc., all, all the time. Nobody else could do it. Once, for the discreet charm of the bourgeoisie, he used to do what we call the découpage, you know, the shot by, how do you say yeah, that? Uh, shot list. Sh shot list, uh, Short list. Short list. Short list. Yeah. Uh, before, just a few days before the beginning of the shooting. 
And one day before the, the shooting of the discreet charm of the bourgeoisie, that will give you a, 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 an example, a, a good one. He called me in Paris and he said to me, please come and help me. I don't know how to make this film. Coming from Brunel's mouth, you know, and lips, I was very surprised. I don't know how to make, make this film. So I went to his hotel and I said, and he, told, he explained to me, I did some films like Belle de Jour, like a class, classical way. You go from one character to the other one, you follow, you go back, then when you, you don't know what to do, you cut, you change, you take another angle, you know. But in this case, the main character is six persons, a group of six friends, you know. They are always together, almost always together. So if I stay at a certain distance, to have the six of them, they would be very little. They would disappear, you know, and I will miss the physical presence of them. If I go from one to the other one every time they speak, the film will look like a machine gun. <laughs> you understand? Me? So I need you, he said to me, I need you to help me to find a way to do the short list, the sh shot by shot. And we worked for a few days together. We we chose two or three scenes in the in the this quick charm, how could we and where could we put the camera and in which way, which direction, etc. And finally, the only solution was obviously the plan sequence. How do you say that? In uh, the, the long take. The long take, you know, the uh, films of uh, uh, shots of two or three minutes, you know, with the camera like this or like this, and the actors going out or in, you know, and the camera slowly moving what we call un plan séquence, you know, the, the two or three minutes, which is very long, at least, you know. So he had never done it before, you know, in that way. And at the end, uh, I remember a little, fur not furious, but uh, discontent. Say, okay, okay, I do this film like Renoir. <laughs> <laughs> and he did, and he was helped, you know, by whom? Indirectly, by Jerry Lewis. Because he never he, he, he never used you know what we call the relay you know the the TV next to the camera that oh, you, the monitors uh, yes allows you which Jerry Lewis actually invented yeah, yeah, yeah. he was the first person and to Jerry Lewis that. was in the same time acting and directing so he needed to see immediately what he had done to to, to correct himself so due to Jerry Lewis who sent us how to use the material you know Budwell for the first time. The, the discrete charm was, and all the other film after this one, the two others, uh, was using this method, and he liked it very much. Uh, and uh, if you see the discrete charm uh, one day or the, another time, you will notice that all the shots are long, two or three minutes or three minutes at least, you know, and there is almost no uh, cutting. That's really interesting. I don't think any of us suspected a connection between Buñuel and Jerry Lewis. It completely changes the history of cinema. Um, right at the back there, thank you. Thank you. Um, to try and um, get an idea, more of an idea about the adaptation, um, could you say ab about the, 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 the gruesome death of the young um, Is that in the novel in the same way? And is there the same amount of ambiguity about, you know, who did it? I mean, or have you, have you changed that? The death of the girl. La mort de la jeune fille, est-ce que c'est dans le roman, est-ce qu'il y a le même goût? No, not, the, not, not at the same level, no, no, not exactly. There is a murder in the, in the novel, but not of a young girl. That's really Buñuel's touch, touch, you know, uh, yeah. But I don't remember, you know, the novel page by page now. That was a long time ago. I have to to read it again, maybe one day. And it's strange because it's a novel that I think people remember now largely yeah. because of this film. And the, yeah. the, the novel's remembered for the film, but the novel has been adapted three times. Three Renoir times. Renoir yeah. did it first. Once by Renoir. It's just been done by Benoit Jacques. Yeah. So it, what, is it, what is it about this novel that has somehow lasted? Sexual perversions, maybe. <laughs> That's one of the possibilities. The relation between uh, servants and masters, of course. 
a, a, a social interest in that sort of relation, which at the time Amir Bo was writing the book was beginning to disappear, to go another direction. Today, all our servants in England and France come from other countries, you know, from and there they sometimes they don't speak French or English. You know, it's totally different. You know, there at that time the the from the shop, I mean the, the servant would come from the countryside, you know, from a few kilometers from the that house, you know. It was a habit. Probably that's one one, uh, one of the reasons. But maybe there are some others, but I'm not a sociologist enough to explain, you know. Uh, what um, what I wanted to say excuse me if I go I go from one not to forget. So somebody asked me how we were working. And I answered by, you know, the uh, inventing every day a new story and going having to tell the story to each other. But there was another thing that we did all the time from the very beginning. We invented a couple of uh, uh, petit bourgeois, French petit bourgeois, middle class French, Henri and Georgette, you know. And this couple was always with us in my room where we were working, you know. Two empty chairs, and they were there. And from time to time, we would ask them what they thought. They were not stupid at all. <laughs> anyway, they had come They had come to see a Bunuel film. And our only purpose was to keep them in the theater until the end of the film, you know. If they are going to leave, and very bad for us, you know. And so Henri and Georgette were always there, and I would, for instance, Ask uh, what do you think of this orchard? Ah, all right, okay. So and then and so on. And I remember sometimes, a few times, I'm proposing an idea. Without answering, Binwell gets up, takes all his papers, files, pens, you know, and goes to the door, walks to the door, and says to the empty chair, "Come, Georgette, come, come along." <laughs> uh, this and he had. This film is not for us, <laughs> and, and, and it would go out of my room, you know, and then it would come back. But it was, it, 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 you know, the fact that we have the, the invisible presence of two possible spectators was extremely interesting to us, you know. If I wanted to say something to Benoel or Louis to me, passing through, you know, uh, Henri and Georgette was very useful, <laughs> very useful. Okay, you, you had one and then you had one. Have you got the microphone? Hang on a sec. Yeah. Um, I'm very interested in Bunuel's use of music and I'm very intrigued at the lack of music in this film. Uh, I think the music box is the only music that I can recall. And the first time I saw this film, I never noticed that there was no music and I was wondering whether that ever came up in your discussions with Bunuel. So in the first uh, films he made, in Chien Andalou, for instance, there is a lot of music. And it was, the film was very known to mix a tango with Wagner, eh? you, you remember, if you remember. And again, in, in the, the two short films he made after that. Then he became deaf. He was in, a, in the surrealistic group, he was the only one to know something about music was ex extremely interested in classical music, going to concert uh, to Saragossa and to some other cities and preparing himself, you know, months before to listen to this concert or to this symphony. But when he lost his hearing, then he decided not to put any more music in the film. That's the reason, except when, like in Tristana, when Catherine Deneuve is playing the piano, except the piece of Brahms that she's particularly playing, you know, at that moment. But the, the, the music as an illustration disappeared completely until the end. Yeah. But he still did very strange things with sound, because in this film there's a moment where you hear a train and there's no train. There was a sort of, of, uh, of uh, if you notice, at the, what we call the titles at the end, you know. Binuel was deaf and that was a secret joke. You have a special uh, uh, sonore uh, sound effects with Binwell. <laughs> because he said, if I hear this, everybody will. Right. <laughs>
Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, yes, please. Um, I was interested by what you uh, said earlier. Uh, excuse me, just to add <laughs> that uh, he was very sad of it, that he had lost, you know, his possibility. Because he was in the surrealistic, the surrealistic group disliked uh, all classical music. He was the only one, you know, to... Yeah, absolutely. He wanted so that was something that happened to him when he was forty, forty-five, and it was very sad of it. That's all. Excuse me. <laughs> that's all right. Um, I was interested by what you said about the fact that the novel is quite episodic, um, but you chose to make it more of a straightforward narrative. And then, of course, you've got *Discreet Charm* with the bourgeoisie and *Phantom of Liberty*, which are themselves incredibly mm. episodic. And I was wondering what if there was a kind of conscious shift, because obviously there was an, an amount of time between Diary of a Chambermaid and Discreet Charm, but the kind of move towards more episodic set piece type films, I was wondering what the kind of, whether there was a, um, a special approach to that, whether they just emerged, or whether there was a kind of dissolution of narrative that was intended. Uh, there was nothing theor theoretical, you know, everything was practical. Uh, we never thought about theory, about uh, it should be like this because, the, you know. Uh, if the film, uh, there is one technical reason that I already talked about, you know, the, the, about the district of the bourgeoisie, to go to the plan séquence, to change his way of working. For the rest, he was trying to, like everybody does, you know, trying to adapt himself to his own idea of storytelling, plus all the obscurity around, you know, without, uh, without uh, losing the possibility from time to time to be obscure, to be dark, the way we all are. There are some moments I don't understand why I do this, why I'm answering you this, you know, I don't know. <laughs> there is some obscure uh, obscurity. We, we all have an obscurity inside ourselves. We know it, and you knew it, of course, uh, very well. And uh, he, he wants to, all the time to leave to the Henri et Georgette the place to adapt their own zone of obscurity to his. You understand? Uh, to share not only the light, what is clear in the story, what is very, very easy to, to explicit, with what is impossible to explain. Uh, you know? That was more or less the. So there is no general theory. We are adapting, you know, every time the, the the form of the story of the of the script to what we wanted to tell or to keep quiet. Right. Uh, um, or to I think hide. <laughs> I think we have time for one more. Um, so if oh, we have like time to, for ten more. Yeah. Well, oh, we'll, do, right. we'll maybe do, we'll make a compromise. <laughs> we'll, we'll go for two more. Um, yeah. So first of all, yeah, please. The, the movies, they're, they're like a compendium of psychopathia sexualis. And uh, I, I just wondered where he got his information on psychopathology. Uh, he had uh, two nephews, psychoanalysts. And uh, he, he, so probably he asked them, you know. And he was extremely interested. Uh, don't forget, it was the time of uh, Freud books, you know, and uh, all the surrealistic was very close to this, uh, uh, to the discovery of a new continent inside ourselves, you know. Uh, uh, a, a huge part of the work of all the surrealists, including painting, writing, sculpture, uh, comes from this discovery that we have some something inside ourselves that the clarity cannot show, cannot transmit, and if we want to participate completely to, a, to an emotion, we have to, to take care of this, you know, that, to be complete. And not I think not the, to um, castrate us mm. you know, from uh, the deepest and sometimes the, the shameful part of ourselves. You yeah. know. And I think the Surrealists did actually have sort of discussion groups and workshops about sexuality. Uh, we will know soon because there is a lot of letters between André Breton and Freud that have to be published 50 years after the death of André Breton. So we'll see. <laughs> Let's wait. Right. <laughs> and, and did you have a question you were about to ask? Wait it's uh, next year. That's... Okay, I'll, I'll just repeat I, that. I, yeah. uh, why, why the very frightening political ending? 
uh, as, as you notice the whole film, in the whole film there is a lot of allusion to the anti-Semitism from the period of when Octave Mirbeau wrote and also from the 30s and uh, when he talks you know, about the Jews. And uh, at the end, I suppose, and I'm, I'm supposing, that Bunuel and I, we wanted not to forget this aspect of the film, that there is this little bourgeoisie was not voting communist at the time, you know, at all, on the contrary. And, and the, the war, the Second war, World War, is coming over pretty soon, in, in another less than 10 years. You know, they will kill each other. All, all. So all of this is there, you know, in this atmosphere, strange, of, the, of a gray countryside, you know, like, uh, like you said, like uh, marécage, or like a swamp. And, uh, and that's all. What can I say? I, I'm not going to, I, I cannot explain what we show. It's impossible, you know, what we try to, to show and, uh, and share. Okay, so um, Jean-Claude Carrier will be back again at the ICA for a longer discussion on the 6th of December. Uh, so in the meantime... Are you sure? Are you sure? Uh, well, he's sure, and so, I believe him. Oh, sorry, um, I go. I'll be here. Well, please, please do. We'd be very I'd happy like to, to listen see to him. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'd like to, th to thank Henri and Georgette, who are here yeah, as well yeah, tonight, so giving much. us their <laughs> wise advice. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank you all very much for coming, and thank you very much. It's okay, been a pleasure. Yeah. <laughs>